met before. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I'm really honored that we have pulled off this incredible show of Martian Markets. It's really uh, an effort of uh, love and there's a lot of proof. Uh, introduce Jennifer Samet, who's uh, the head of um, archive and research with the gallery. And it's a continuum of what the gallery is about, which is to really re-examine and reintroduce work that just needs to be out and seeing the bigger picture. So thank you again. Hi, thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. And thank you, Eric, for your vision and belief and love in painting. So nice to be here with this work. And thank you to Marcia Marcus, first of all. And my daughter Kate, who is with us here recording the panel. Okay, I'm going to introduce our panel. So this is David Cohen, who will be moderating our panel. They are very lucky to have the master panel moderator here. <laughs> he really is. Uh, he is the editor and publisher of ArtCritical.com and founder and moderator of the Review Panel, which is the Critics Forum hosted by the Brooklyn Public Library and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which is also podcast at his website, Art Critical. He was gallery director at the New York Studio School from 2001 to 2010 an art critic and contributing editor at the New York Sun from 2003 to 2008. Born in London and educated at Sussex and at the Courtauld Institute of Art, David wrote for leading newspapers and magazines in England and around the world before emigrating to the United States in 1999. And his books include Alex Katz's Collage, a Catalog Resume, 2005. Angela Dufresne grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City and received her BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute and her MFA from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Her work has been exhibited at Monu Row Gallery and CRG. I had the pleasure of working with Angie on an exhibition of videos and drawings at Stephen Hardy Fine Art Projects. She is an assistant professor at the Rhode Island School of Design and led the RISD in Rome program last year and then taught at Skowhegan School all summer. So I am very thrilled to have Angie back in New York, as I know a lot of us are this fall. Um, solo exhibitions have, of her work have been held at Hammer Projects, Hammer Museum, and the McAllister Gallery, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and she has an upcoming exhibition next year at the Kemper Museum. Mimi Gross is a painter, set, and costume designer and maker of interior and exterior installations. She has lived and worked in Tribeca for the last 40 years. And over the last year, Mimi Gross's work was presented in several venues, including the Inventing Downtown exhibition at the Gray Art Gallery of NYU, a group show at Derek Eller Gallery, Art Market Provincetown, and a large-scale painting commission for the Kentucky Chandler Hospital as well as a solo exhibition this past year at the Shrine Gallery in the Lower East Side. Uh, from 1960 to 76, Mimi collaborated with artist Red Grooms on many large multi-dimensional installations, including the fabled Ruckus Manhattan. She's collaborated with the dancer Douglas Dunn on more than 25 dances designing set and costumes, um, beginning with foot rules in 1978. She was also a friend of Marcia Marcus and a central part of Marcus's artist community in Provincetown, New York, and Florence in the late 50s and 60s, along with Jay Milder, Bob Thompson, and Red Grooms. Woo! <laughs> Derek Forger was born in Memphis, Tennessee, to parents of Ghanaian heritage. His work has appeared in exhibitions at Roberts and Tilton Gallery in Los Angeles, Sotheby's S2 Gallery in New York, and Luce Gallery in Turin, Italy. He is the recipient of the C12 Emerging Artist Award 2017, and was also awarded the 2016 Sugar Hill Museum Artist in Residence, and currently, 2017, the Sharp Studio Program in New York City. 
He's a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, earned a master's degree in art education from Harvard and an MFA in painting at Hunter College. And you have an upcoming, some upcoming projects, Dirk. Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> tell us. Uh, I, I have a group show in Monte de Cardas in Switzerland that's happening in uh, December, and uh, a solo at uh, Nina Johnson in Miami, and then a solo at Night Gallery in LA, and then another with Josh Lilly in London. Thank you very much. Wow, what, what spirited introductions. It's almost time to go home now after such a, <laughs> such a, such a, such a, such a fulsome. And you, you see why they call her the director of uh, archive and research. She, 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 uh, you, you, you missed out my secondary education. That's the only... Uh, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, it's, it's, it's really incredibly exciting to be here. Uh, we were sitting in the green room before and um, Mimi said, well, are, are you interested in... Uh, the work or the artist or the environment and I felt like somebody who has just gone to his favorite restaurant and they say we can offer you this this and this and I'll say yes I'll take it all thank you because um, what does one not want on such a fabulous lineup of course uh, where the emphasis lies will 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 develop in the course of our conversation um, I suspect it will need to begin and end with the work because it's just such an extraordinary exceptional I, you know, sometimes it's like, it's like you go somewhere and somebody was given or inherited a, a, a beautiful a Cadillac or Buick or something from the 60s and they just kept it in the garage and once a year the chauffeur tuned it up but nobody ever took it out for a ride and then suddenly somebody says, this is a damn good car, let's take it for a ride and they just open the garage and they drive out and all those people in their SUVs and their miserable whatevers turn around and say, whoa, where has that been? Because these are uh, these have been a hidden treasure, and uh, these are a revelation, uh, a, a window onto something uh, quite riveting. Uh, it's it's this very strange phenomenon. It's a bit like going to Petra in the in Jordan. You know, you go there and you say, it's it's familiar because it reminds you of this kind of architecture and that kind of architecture and the other kind of architecture, and yet you have never seen this in your life. I mean, this is Namibian architecture, which is uh, a rather distinct school. Um, so, I mean, this is, uh, her works recall so many of the people uh, we find really interesting, and yet, um, and yet they are very, very much their own thing and exist in, in, in independence of whatever it might remind us of. And and have that kind of locked in the garage freshness that I was uh, uh, alluding to. Um, so, as, as Jen has kind of intimated in, in some, of, well, in certainly in introducing Mimi, Mimi is our, uh, our living link to the, to the, to the woman herself. Uh, uh, she'll describe for us the, uh, uh, the, the quality of uh, the, the kind of friendship she had, and, and, and she will be our uh, our go-to, our, our, uh, the oracle, our source on um, uh, how Marsha was possibly responding to her environment and how she was, uh, uh, what her, her values were that are, are, are most evident in, in the work and the dilemmas she would have faced also as, as, a, as a woman in an environment that we can all imagine or we can hardly imagine as inhospitable to serious uh, creative endeavor in the 1960s and 70s. Um, Angie um, and, and Derek, like me, uh, are coming with sort of bewildered new eyes, relatively speaking, to this work, though each will uh, describe what they um, have um, uh, in their own terms, um, how they relate to it. Um, uh, Angela, uh, I, I uh, and Derek are both, uh, in fact all three panellists are, are people whose work I've admired and followed for quite some time. Uh, Derek, a couple of years ago I met at an, an art fair and was just absolutely bowled over by his, his, his work. I've asked uh, Jen if, if anybody hasn't gone ahead and Googled the artists that we're seeing tonight or um, perhaps indeed looking at it on your phone this very minute. Um, the, one of the computers at the back will have some of the pages of of the artists' websites up. So, but Derek's work um, 
uh, his, his, his interest in uh, the vocabularies of, of sporting characters and, and of um, uh, people of different backgrounds and a kind of certain historicity in the work but at the same time very contemporary uh, and this uh, the beautiful kind of collision of a, um, uh, 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 an American naive flattening with a, a, a deeply um, European modernist sensibility is something that um, I think makes him a real natural to bring uh, his insights into the work of, of Marsha Marcus and Angela um, is is so much the 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 master of a kind of um, uh, Renaissance painting uh, and yet with a, a, a hipster other outsidery present um, sensibility that um, she I, I know is going to have something to say on Marsha Marcus because these are um, these are images from the 60s and 70s which are um, burning hot with the kind of issues and excitement of, the, of that period. And at the same time, um, they are figure paintings, complex figure paintings and, and scene paintings that um, put us right back into old master easel painting and, and fresco painting. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's, that's why I brought these guys together. Um, that's, that's, that's how we have this amazing panel. Um, you'll, from now on, I hope, be hearing less from me, but that's, uh, that's what I, that's, that's, uh, that's who we have tonight. And I, I think, Mimi, I would really like to start with you because of your uh, personal connection with me, with Marsha. Um, tell us how... I'd first like to totally disagree with you that it's like going to Petra. Right. <laughs> having gone to Petra and having known Marsha. Right. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't really... I just want to point out the wonderful painting of the woman in the yellow bikini. Yes. It's Emily Mason. Right. Wolfkahn's... Uh, yeah. And she is now in almost 90 years old, and she looks exactly the same. <laughs> She has the same orange bikini, or is she she's <laughs> upgraded. She's not worn out. She's better naked, but the point right. is that her her figure is the same, and she still wears little ponytails. Yeah, I had dinner with her not so long ago. Same yeah, delicate way of standing. Yes, it's incredibly realistic portrait. In this painting, I don't recognize. Uh, there's Jill Johnston, who yeah. some of you may know is the great writer about performance and dance in the 60s for the boys. And sitting in the black coat is the gorgeous Belle Barbara Forst. She was a great Belle of Soho. And Marsha, and I don't know who the... That's the, her father and, her, and Marsha herself as a child from a photograph. Well, there you are. Very Petra-like, yes. <laughs> I did go to Petra. It yes. Everybody should go there. No yes, one. yes. But the point about Petra was just to say that it's, 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 it's familiar and yet weird at the same time. That's yeah, what I was saying. You, we have to go through this long, 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 long canyon before you yes. get here. Right. Well, we had to come up with these stairs to get here. So, I mean, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the equivalent. But, and as I said, you won't be hearing much from me anymore. So, so, so Mimi, how did you meet Marsha? Tell us how you met Marsha. I wanted to point out her of course. love of Mantegna, which yes. is they might as well go for the real thing. Yes. Because her, her love of Renaissance painting is apparent. And she did have a, a, a trip to Italy when she received a grant from Walter Gutman, who in general supported a lot of downtown artists when nobody else did including our movie Shoot the Moon, which everyone else rejected. And um, she was there for almost a year, and I was there when Kate was born, and she was mm -hmm. born one block away from where I was living. And wow. so uh, her sister Jane was in a stroller, mm -hmm. and I painted her in the stroller. And Marcia would leave Jane outside of a store because Italians love little kids. Yes. So she's totally safe to leave her anywhere, yep. which she did. Right. She'd go to a museum okay. and leave Jane in the stroller. <laughs> Before Kate was born, finally Kate got born and it was a little bit different. Right. But then she had Terry, her husband too, was a devoted helper actually. 
So uh, one of the other things besides Mantegna is Marsha's extraordinary work ethic, which I think is, if I have anything to say, that's basically it. It's apparent in the work, but it also it meant everything else was in love of her family was real, but everything was second to her work hours, and I'm sure you remember it. And um, it, it was also um, something that she claimed she learned from Edwin Dickinson, who was her professor at the Art Students League. She said he taught her to, to work, to never stop working, and so she did. That's Amazing. my main message. She was a very, very colorful person, and she did have lots of great parties. It was like seven flights. Was it seven <laughs> flights? Four. Four. <laughs> 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 not, four. Not, like more than not, not unlike coming up here. Right. <laughs> yeah, I remember once uh, Terry parked really quickly near the house, and um, he went to the store uh, maybe 10 minutes later. And all the car, or the wheels of your, all the tires were gone. <laughs> <laughs> so Avenue D. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Side was different then. Yeah, it was, but it was a great place. And in that place, there were many, many wonderful parties. Yeah. Yeah, I did pose for Marsha. We watched uh, Fred Stair movies while I was posing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Were you able to stay still with watching all that dance? I mean, uh, yeah, it didn't inspire you to like. Tap around a bit. <laughs> well, I'm sure Marsha would have kept you in line. No, she's. Oh, so he had some stick roll. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Angela, um, how how do you come to know uh, Marsha's work, and um, what's your what are your impressions? Um, hipster impressions. <laughs> yes. Just kidding. Um, or old master <laughs> impressions. <laughs> um. <coughs> I, I had seen some of the works up at Williams College, so there's the portrait back there oh, with the, the landscape back. That's yes. very kind of, um, and loved them and and documented them and thought, who is this under-recognized amazing woman? And my reaction would be because I've I, I've only just now read any kind of significant amount about her was. Um, like artists like Judith, Judith Lanier and, and um, like the changes that someone like Joan Brown went through in this, mm -hmm. around the same time from, and we were, and um, Derek and I were just talking about that back in the green room. Um, or I was talking to Derek, he was. Listening patiently. He was politely <laughs> listening to me, thankfully. Thank you, Derek. Um, um, the, um, my, my thought was that there, there was really four things going on that were that are incredibly helpful for me. Well, there's about eight thousand things that are going on, but there's like four things that I could say quickly that help me as a as a painter today who happens to have a vagina. Um, and and that and not to be an essentialist or anything so obscene, but um, that number one, she was grappling with the influences and the challenges and the critique that minimalism was bringing to painting like all of the big guys who were getting big bucks for doing the same thing and wasn't getting the recognition. Um, she was able to, uh, meta uh, to, to metabolize the influence of history and create a synchronic articulation of contemporaneousness and historic understanding of painting at the same time, which was blowing my mind. Um, uh, she was definitely, and I'm gonna tag into, and by the way, I'm really honored to be with all of you. I mean, especially Mimi, just because she is a goddess of New York City that we all need to bow down to. As Jennifer Hickey says in her posts, bow down. Bow down. Um, that um, that she, she, her work ethic was not learned from anyone. There's, you can't learn work ethic like this as a painter from anyone else. You have to be obsessed, you have to be a freak, you have to be perverted, you have to have the appetite. And the appetite of these paintings is, it, are, it embodies an ambition that is as old as Rome and as new as Warhol at the time. And 
The fourth thing, which is incredibly important that I was going to say like someone like um, Judith Lanier or Alice Neal or Mimi, are, is the fact that she never put her feminine, her woman, cell phone down. Um, she, never, she never put aside her feminine subjectivity to make art. She mm. always held the intensity, the intimacy, the emotional implications of what women do when they look at each other and witness each other um, in the forefront of the painting or perform in the painting, right? Like I think in the essay in the catalog, there's talk about comparing her to Cindy Sherman and all this stuff. And I think that that is, well, oh, it's, it's a little ridiculous. But, um, but it, th in that sense, like what she's doing is so empathetic and so much from a place of love. It is not the same kind of critique of the creation of persona and, um, and identity as that. I mean, I, I, I understand wanting to bring significance to this work but I think actually the the fact that she never surrenders her subjectivity as a woman to look at other women to try to take the viewer to witness and to drag the viewer into that space is incredibly rigorous and deeply meaningful and other than many of those pursuits that other people have had and in this way this is something where I just deeply identify with that as an ambition, that as a project, mm -hmm. and that as something that really is, is to a certain extent, I mean, maybe it's not a, okay, I'm just gonna throw this out there because I'm sort of known for this. Maybe it's not a nice car in the um, garage. Maybe that nobody's seen in a while, but like a really sexy, like hairy vagina with like a dildo on it, right? It's like this thing of, of like this really unapologetic way of celebrating the, the, the shared, the kind of looking that a, a woman does and shares with other women. And that way it's like Cassatt, the performativity of them are like, are like, and the rigor of them is like Gintileski. Okay, I think we'll all be looking at these paintings in a very different way now. <laughs> but to maybe say that what, what Angela is saying is contemporary and in the time when Marsha was painting, it was, you wouldn't say in the closet because she was relatively known in the late 50s and 60s. You know, she did have a, a, a genuine professional reputation and was showing and felt successful herself. However, the, the, the fight for it was real. Yeah. Mm. And it was still downtown. You know, it's not like it, it got overboard. It just was limited within itself. Whereas you can speak, you have the freedom knowing that it's ingrained in you, this without a doubt. Yeah. With her, she had to push it and make it happen. Yeah. And yeah. I think that people should recognize that. Mm. That's amazing. And I, I'm saying it, I think, because I'm trying to recognize yes, yeah. you are. how important that is and how much it made space for me. I think we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to this issue. But Derek, I'd like to broaden the um, reach now to, 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 to include something that I, I, I feel is a strong affinity between uh, your work and, and Marsha's, and, and that is that um, there is this play in your work and, and in hers between uh, the present and a sense of the archaic or history uh, and, and a kind of layering of time, but there's also um, a way in which this um, play with a very stylized forms of um, of both port of both likeness and uh, modes of representation and kinds of patterning, um, they all achieve a kind of um, a wistful or vulnerable sensibility, um, and and that's uh, I wonder if, if if you're noticing an affinity there with what 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 you're interested in doing and what you're able to respond to in Marsha's work. Well, I definitely uh, respond you know, at kind of a sensory level. I think when I saw, saw these images initially, they were, you know, on, on computer screen. Mm. And I think that that really sells these works short because they appear to be very flat. Uh -huh. uh, but one of the things that I really responded to right away was her touch mm -hmm. and how much translucence and layering and kind of building of the painting that she shows. There's a lot of the architecture that's evident. But I'd like to bring the conversation, I guess, 
uh, some contemporary examples of portraiture that I think really are in conversation with this work, uh, like the work of Barclay Hendricks mm. um, and Amy Sherrill, who's a young African American <coughs> artist who's just tapped to paint yeah. Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. But I really see a relationship between how Amy was thinking about, how she is thinking about portraiture and what we see uh, from these works. But when I make a painting, I try to make one that I hope will last for 20 years, 30 years, or longer. Or centuries. Or centuries. I'm not so <laughs> audacious to say, but, <laughs> but I'm, really sh I'm really struck by how contemporary the works feel. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like old works. They feel right. so fresh. Mm -hmm. And I think to be able to, to chaff, tap into something and make the kind of image that, that can last the way these do and be in conversation over a uh, centric uh, uh, decade mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. So yes, and that I think uh, in studying them more closely, I didn't know that this was like some kind of stucco down here on this. Yeah, I think it's yeah. uh, it's actually cement or oh, sand at the it bottom. Like cement or sand. Uh, and there's a flower on the in her hair, an and actual an actual you know dead flower, and there's some collaging with newspaper that I'm very <coughs> much interested in collaging and, and texture and this play between what is real and what is an object and. Uh, so there's a lot of sophistication to work, uh, but I guess the, the timelessness of them is something mm. that I probably learned from the most. Yeah. I mean, Mimi, um, or, uh, she, she's a graduate of the Cooper Union as well as studying at the Art Students League with Dickinson, as we know. And the Cooper Union, as, as Alex Katz has described in his memoirs, and she, he was a, a, a classmate of hers, uh, He's, he's, he described it in, in terms of its um, kind of what he calls its provincial modernism uh, in that there's a generation of artists still very much steeped in Ecole de Paris and Braque and Picasso and Durand people. Um, and um, in many ways I can see um, Marsha breaking free of that kind of pedagogy but at the, at the same time just in the example of that sand in, in that element and the, the collage elements in the work um, a, a, and also in um, some of the some other kind of formal decisions um, there, there does seem to be um, some some rootedness in um, in a quite a European sensibility I, I wonder how much of these these paintings are breaking into a very American idiom and how much they are um, steeped in older traditions. Do you have a sense of how she felt personally towards such an issue as that? I don't know what she thought personally. Kate might. Well, uh, um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in Kate a little later, but... Um, Do you mind if I chime in a little Yeah, bit please. Um, like, this painting instantly made me think of Domenico Gnoli. Now, mm. they were in Italy at the time. Did you guys know him? Or no, no. But I'm sure they were aware of his work. And to me, the way in which Nioli was mm. metabolizing Renaissance mm. painting mm. and up the mm. influx of American pop art in Rome. Yeah. At the time, did not know. This is before didn't. she went to Italy. So it is. Yeah. 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 Also, she. But he used sand in the painting like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, a lot of people use sand. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, what what I feel is that Marcia kind of got an osmosis from Florence more than yeah. literally mm. rushing to the frescoes. Right. The big painting with red laying down on the bottom. Yeah. It, that was a killer. You know, it was, mm. he nearly died posing beside <laughs> the witness. <laughs> freezing, freezing. He was laying on a stone, some kind of pedestal, excuse me. Uh, but she made a wonderful portrait of him, especially the feet look just like him. But the uh, the sensibility of that big painting, which is overwhelmingly ambitious, yeah. did right there. She went to the pl she arrived super pregnant without uh, Terry by herself, and uh, immediately rented some car. She's ready to go and rented a, a small place on Piazzale Michelangelo, mm -hmm. which is the view, and immediately started this humongous painting. You know, and then shortly after that, Kate was born. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was mm. pretty amazing. Ha. Amazing. Yeah. Tell us, I mean, I, I, w I want to explore and, and learn both the, the history and the context, but also just we're, we're at liberty to misread and, and take possession of these paintings and do what we like with them. And I want to explore one particular issue, and that is her, her strong affinity with people of color. 
why, why there is uh, it, just in, in this selection of, of work we have that exquisite painting of Jack which is the boy on that end wall there and then there's the woman looking in the mirror or not looking at, uh, looking away from the mirror but she's in her with her bare midriff and that, that extraordinary orange outfit and um, uh, um, even um, even uh, Emily Mason almost is made to look like a person of color, although we know she's not. But um, um, and then there's a uh, an African American probably family or a Caribbean family on the beach. Um, do we do we have some? You, I have a lot to say about well, that. say say a lot, but in a short. Uh, give us give us some info, and then uh, then I want us to you know the the, the younger panelists to to speculate as well once they hear the... Well, only that before 1964, the community downtown was incredibly integrated with great informality and love. And <laughs> Sheila, who I knew all these years, and mm -hmm. we, we're old friends, Sheila, is the former wife of Jane Wilder. And it was a community that color was not an issue, although for for black people it might have been sometimes, but basically it wasn't. It was full of love. The jazz scene was extremely lively. There were lots of places to go to hear music, and it was basic, almost free or low-priced and very available. There were parties all the time, and musicians were integrated. Comes integration, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there's a barrier. All of our friends change their names. We were Jones most famous. And suddenly it was self-conscious. And you'd go to a party and do this. Oh, you touched me. You know, it was rough. It, and of course, the situation is worse than ever now. But it was a change that was incredible, how it affected the art community and the social life. Hmm. And, and it's something that you don't know particularly about now, but it really is true. So is it just that it was a such a happily integrated uh, that that she wouldn't have noticed that half the people sh or a, 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 a interesting well, the significant have a party, segment? For example, Marsha and Terry would have a party, for example, mm -hmm. and there were as many co all different colored people, you know, yeah. every color. Yeah, but uh, somebody who's a somebody who is a uh, a fiercely ambitious artist and wants to make her mark and and is incredibly. Um, uh, thoughtful and judicious in in every detail that she includes in her work can't be can't be oblivious to the fact that she's made what is in the history of representation and uh, a fairly unusual choice to include such a high percentage of um, people of color. So uh, I, I think, think it might be a bigger issue to you. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, that's why and, and I don't mean that as a natural. dig. No, that's okay. But, but I'll take it. When I look at the works of Alice Neal, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. who was also born in New York City, mm -hmm. she seemed to paint her world and the people yeah. of the world. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me that this is uh, a sampling of her life, mm -hmm. the trips to Europe, yeah. painting well, outdoors, that's right? That's exactly right. And, and as someone who makes paintings, I understand that when you think about paintings or talk about them or critique them, they become politicized, and there's a different level of analysis. But I think uh, every good artist is a reflection of his, her or his own life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get from looking at at least this selection of paintings. Uh, and then as you see to bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's like, oh, you, will you pose for me? Right. right. If I feel that kind of sincerity. I mean, I'm always, when I mean, you're a person of color, you're always wondering why or what the intention is, but I trust it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, I think it's apparent. It's my two cents. Yeah, I felt the same way. but And I also feel a little like, a little, I feel like it, it, we should be a little cautious to kind of like recontextualize this thing as like either some kind of utopic period in the in tri, in Tribeca or Soho at the time because as much as the parties were and the hanging out might have been um, there might have been a kind of equality or a sort of democratic way in which people were hanging out that wasn't that was integrated, and I will take James Baldwin's definition of what integration means in that way. Um, the museums and the galleries weren't. So there's a whole other level, uh, there's a whole other portal in which um, the parties might have been great, but the, the actual exposure was great. And it's sort of, and it's also like, we also don't, 
and I think this is where we, I would always have to defer to Mimi on this, but you know, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Carol Rama. Oh, she was another Cadillac that was parked in the garage mm -hmm. and nobody knew about until it came out. But in fact, she had a show in Italy almost every year of her life. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew who she was, and now she's had this show at the New Museum. But she was quite a well-established artist mm. um, at the time, and fully for the, her singularity as an artist. And um, Dorothy Anone. Whereas with Dorothy Anone, whereas you know Bob Thompson is a high-profile person, but there's hundreds of other African American artists at that time that went unrecognized and were, in fact, erased historically. So. And I, I don't, I, I don't want to undermine that or like over, inf over romanticize the fact that she did this thing, which we all should have been doing. You mm. know. On the other hand, the issue of women is interesting from that time because, as as widely as the races were integrated, the women were not accepted in the way they are now. You know, and that's a completely different story, as everybody here knows. That you were, you were the wife your girlfriend, or the hang around, or groupie, yeah. but you certainly weren't the artist. And in Marsha's case, she had the parties. She was, you know, picking people to pose. She was the artist, which is very singular about her. Mm. I wonder if she knew, like, you know, Stettheimer's parties, you know, like, if that was No, like she's it. not that old. <laughs> no, not that she went to them, but if she knew about them, is no, all. I think so. no, no, no. We all knew Stenheimer mainly from the from the dollhouse. Oh uh, yeah, know, right. It wasn't like we knew that many paintings by her. Mm. 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 Everyone saw the show. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, extraordinary show. And yes. the opera was amazing. And the opera was absolutely amazing. Mm. Also, the one she didn't do. Mm. Yeah, the one she didn't. That was the one I was thinking. Mm. For both. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Marsha was very aware of that concept you mentioned, where she was an American artist looking at Italian art. Right. And I, I, the minimalism idea is certainly interesting. Mm. She had her own sense of where she was at in terms of pop art as well as minimalism. Yeah, you know, that's, that's very really clear. That's her era. And I, what is by minimalism, I don't quite know what we mean because I mean I I know that they're restrained and that they have great economy. But I don't think anyone would class her or Alex Katz or uh, Will Barnett as minimalists. I mean, well, I wouldn't put her in the same category anyway. But the point is that I think that the clarity of her edges yes. and mm -hmm. the seriousness of modular tones yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes her a minimalist by nature, yeah. not literally in a, in a geometric abstract sense. That's right. Okay, I'm uh, not. What? It's a minimalist, minimalist with a small M. Small M. Sure. Yeah, I would. Marsha with a big M. <laughs> Mimi with two M's. <laughs> right. Is there only two in there? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a great pair of eyes. Yes. Well, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you resisted when you said I wouldn't put them in the same category as, as Will Barnett or Alex Katz. I mean, can we not see some of strong affinities between these three artists? Um, there is an affinity with Will Barnett's work, yes, yes. in terms of uh, composition more than anything. Yes. I think Marsha is actually more contemporary in, in the sense of the, her selection of subject matter. More contemporary, you mean more Will relevant Barnett. now? Or, or yeah, yeah mm -hmm. if there were three paintings by Will Barnett with three paintings by Marcia, yeah. I think one would feel more contemporary with Marcia's, as I do seeing him now. Yeah. However, I do love Will Barnett's work yeah. as the person. What I he saw, was a great yeah. Teacher. He was mm -hmm. a wonderful teacher as well. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But with Alex Katz, obviously, I mean, and Lois Dodd and, and Marcia, I mean, they're, like, they're in the same <laughs> class. Uh, literally at school and and um, if you took their work and then showed them in the context of the rest of the entire history of art you'd say okay those three have got something in common I mean I don't think there's subject wise uh, no technique wise subject wise composition wise uh, sensibility wise uh, 
I shape think, consciousness wise. I, I think what's happening here is that uh, this is uh, a critic who's, you have a wonderful art historical knowledge and the way I think a critic looks at a painting, the way artists look at them are sometimes different, not at odds. Right. Um, but I think that that's what's happening because contextualizing the work is really important yeah. for history. Mm -hmm. But you knew the artist and you knew her personally and contextualizing doesn't really matter. Right? As much. No, not at all. Right. So I think that. I think that's. Oh, but then you're the synthesis because you didn't know the artist, and you're not an art critic, and you're a wonderful painter. So you tell us if you think it's far fetched to think that uh, her work and Alex Katz have an affinity. No, I think. Uh, first of all, I'm trying to keep peace on the panel. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, but my job as a moderator is to stir things up. So. As long as you're okay. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. I agree with both, actually. I mean, I do agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Talk about the paint. Yeah, about, about the paint. Talk about I the know paint. what I'm curious about is yeah. her, her, her sense of design, the reductionist mm. approach. She removed a lot of information. There's a lot of information that she withholds. Mm -hmm. And there's a strong sense of graphic sensibility and design. What, I want to know where that might have come from or that impulse or... Uh, mm. I'm just curious, you can assign the question as you like, but... No, you ask uh, it. No, no, no. Yeah. But I, I'm just curious about that, because mm. it's a very distinct decision. Observation and patience. Okay. Mm. One thing I super remember when I was posing for she would have these globs of paint and put them on a palette knife and very slowly mm. take a little paint at a time off the palette knife rather than the glob. Interesting. And then at the end, she saved her globs by putting water on top of them. Hmm. So that they stay, yeah. No, just covered, covered them with water right. so they yeah. would stay yeah. wet. Yeah. Oh. Which is a good technique to... Yeah, I've done that. It works pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> symptomatic of a Depression era well, childhood, isn't it? No, no. You don't want to waste paint. Yeah, you mix That's what I mean. color yeah. and, you, you know, God knows yeah. you can never mix exactly that color again. Right, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> Even if you want to. Huh. And speaking of color, I mean, look at okay. some of these. I think it's mm. part of these nuances in white or these mm. greens to that close kind of chromatic tension is very difficult mm -hmm. to pull off. Right. Yeah. So you're saying she was methodical and spent a lot of time achieving yeah. these colors, yeah. It's Probably. very clear. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, I don't understand why it's such a hard thing to think about, like, the relationship these have to minimalism, but yet everybody can talk about Chuck Close and the grid and the mm. kind of abstracting as being somehow a reaction or a critique of minimalism. Like, it makes perfect sense to me, the way in which, but you can see there's a pink, on the left side of her head, the gray silver tone is pinkish on the left side, and it gets really gray on the side of the file. And that's the process of working. And it's also just the process of flattening and doing what Derek said beautifully, which is, is, is to a certain extent, um, editing and deleting out superfluous information. Um, mm. But that process of editing is present in the fact that the grays don't match, and that's what makes that painting so amazing. The yellows don't perfectly match, right? There's a temporality mm. to all of that mm. that is n definitely not about representation. Well, except right? that the it's gray area is a photograph, and it is a reconstruction of a photograph. So it's, I think it's very much about being the black and white of photography against the... Uh, the color of life. But it's so conceptual, if that's a way mm. of describing it. And also, yeah. it contrasts with the cake, which mm. has this yellow in it, which yeah. is the same yellow that's in the background, Yes. it makes that gray really richer and sure. in front of us more. Sure. And that lovely way that the, her heel is like a connection between these two worlds, the the, 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 the patterned textured world. I mean, this is, I mean we haven't even brought up Piero, but like right. this, this sense yeah, of like of stillness and the kind of infinite frozen moment mm. um, that is so related to what so many artists were trying to do um, at that time. They, you know, mm. taking out the gestures or freezing things in time. I don't know. Mm. That, but, and, 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 and the reduction of form into something that's, that's that addresses the theatricality of the painting frame mm -hmm. and freezes it and, and indexes just how much the frame is a limitation. And and she and it, especially in this one, like the way she turns it on its side, yeah, is the diamond. Yes, yeah, is 
I mean, she's 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 so smart about kind of calling that out, and it's like that could just as easily be like, mm. a, I don't know, Kate Nolan or something. I don't know, but that 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 she throws a figure in there, and I think she understands yeah. that you can place a figure in that configuration and still have that kind of. Um, mm. the, the word is like a very, uh, it's a it's a it's a base kind of relationship with the materiality of the, of the thing. It's not formal. That's where she has in common with Alex, who did some yes. oval portraits of Ada mm. and some diamond portraits of Ada mm. around that time. Yeah. Well, uh, Red had a gallery on 24th Street uh, in which he showed Red his Grooms. work yeah. and, and, and Alex's work. Mm. 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 But basically, they didn't hang out together. They didn't hang out. And the, the psychology of these paintings are completely different than Alex's. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. She's a she's a teller of tales, and she's with with her. There's a whole story, and with Alex, it's strictly a portrait, a type. Um, that's the way I see it. Mm. No, well, he has his stories when he does, does like the cocktail party. Yeah, and it has many many portraits, and they interact with one another. Mm. Yeah, but even there, it's like an accumulation of many portraits, and with her, a singular portrait is telling a story. I, I would I would. Richly. Yeah. Yeah. I think the difference between her and Katz to me is uh, she, she chooses to render at times and at mm. times to withhold. Yeah. Whereas most of the Katz that I see right. yeah. is graphic throughout. There's a mm. concern with flatness throughout. And, you know, and speed. Uh, Kat, Alex yeah. has a... Yeah. Has a, a to the style <coughs> and varying it. Right. That's right. It's about style mm. and concision and compression. Yeah. And that's why I say that she, to a certain extent, and you know, people can shoot me for this, but she, to a certain extent, like, um, has this thing that I think painters like, also like Becca Fumi or, or Duccio has, which is that you go through vast areas of the paintings where it's just gold leaf or ooze, and then suddenly you lock into this fucked up person that's staring out of the painting at you, and you're like, ah, like how'd that get there? What about a baby? And it's like, Katz never does that. I mean, I love Katz, but it's it's like this, yeah. like, <laughs> we ride through these paintings in this luxury of confidence and blah, blah, blah. And, and with her, it's like we, we, we get, we get, we move through the painting in these complex gestural configurations where it's like we go from up from that hand and the cane to those beautiful tiles to that like weird distorted NBC logo. <laughs> then there's this like fucked up thing and then it's like this girl is trying to seduce me and she's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. this is what I mean by like the level of implication of a woman looking versus a man looking. Well, I'm sorry. She, she, no, no, no need to apologize because Alex Kallix is, <laughs> is more of a, a modernist than she is. And that's why I think her work looks a little, uh, may look um, more contemporary because I think she is actually, ne without necessarily intending it, this mix of speeds and yeah. degrees of rendering with uh, open, uh, you, you, you guys want to call it minimal, I just want to call it reductive open space, uh, that, that mix of but we temperature, don't call it uh, that mix of, if you let me finish my sentence, yes, that exactly. mix of uh, temperatures and strategies and devices, mm -hmm. which you're saying is a feminine way of looking at the world, I, I'd say is a, a more traditional way of constructing a painting um, and, and maybe that's what makes it look more postmodern. Well, are, you re are you rejecting cool. the idea of her gaze as a woman, or no? Um, I'm not enthusiastic about that kind of essentialism, but I think I, I'm open to it. But um, I, I'm more interested in whether it's modernist or... I'm, inter I'm more interested in the, the difference in Alex and Marsha is not the difference in male and female, it's the difference between somebody whose ambition is, is a, in, in the Katz's case, is one of a... a, a a high style, but a formal integrity. And I think with um, Marsha, um, there's more kind of nuance of local decisions about style and strategy that you wouldn't get in a Katz. Katz is more all over. I think Katz's energy and ambition is to make paintings as, as, as immediate and sensational as a Franz Klein, but with a figurative subject. And I don't think Marsha's interest lay there. And therein lies the connection to the kind of masculine canon. Whatever I like what you said a lot about mm. about the um, oops about the um, about the way in which she actually is to a certain extent making a more traditional painting. Yeah. And I think it's in that way. It's because I think she's like 
she's living in many places in Italy. Very obvious that you walk in this room and the Italian yeah. is massive in here. But you live in many places. She she Italy was quite a bit later, though, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a you know, singular trip to Arezzo to see mm -hmm. the Pieros, which... Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Piero at Marcia, okay, because it's more fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, she got... And more flattering as well, as much as... <laughs> yes. Why talk about Alex or Barnett if you can talk yeah, about Piero? I mean, right. right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and she right. deserves it. I agree. Yeah. I think uh, it also is really what she was. But about. let's not call Piero a minimalist, please. <laughs> it yes. wasn't. Right. Oh, I'm relieved no, to hear it. Would never be yeah. Piero minimalist. Okay. But but I would say that they ha that her love of Piero comes through. Yeah. And that the lyricism of Piero, the flow, the mm. the, the charm, the, the delicate gestures. That these are things that she was truly inspired by, mm, with yeah. great obsess and love. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and she, although she was in Florence, there were some pieces yeah. there. But for example, she didn't know about Pantormo. You know, now today, you know, Pantormo is something that you breathe and you're, he's part of our life. Yeah, but well, he's been admitted time, into the canon, and there he was. He was not, considered a suspect. Not conserved, and mm. he, and he and other mannerists were basically put down, you know, yeah. Duccio was, he was yeah. our guy, mm -hmm. and, and after Duccio, well, Cimabui, Duccio, Giotto, yeah. those were the three biggies when we lived in Florence. Right, right. You know, and Piero and Uccello came along. Mm. Mm. But I mean, I know we're supposed to be talking about Piero and I shouldn't bring back cats, but if you look at the, if you look at the portrait of Lucas Samaras in the, in the dunes, um, uh, at one level, and you can all see it afterwards, it's, it's a sort of gold painting between, on this side of the, of the wall. Um, on the one hand, just, and, and this relates to the fact that she's in Provincetown on the dunes, Alex also visits Provincetown, makes a collage in exactly the same year that almost looks, you know, as if they were in the same dune, um, and maybe Mimi they were. But um, what, what, what Marsh is willing to do in making a portrait of a Greek guy is, is make it look like a Greek icon, bringing in the gold. And that's, it's as if each picture, each personality uh, <coughs> demands um, almost a narrative kind of solution to uh, what style strategy to adopt in making that the most convincing portrait of that person. Whereas an Alex, uh, everyone is just an Alex Katz in, the, in an Alex Katz painting. Now, whether I'm not saying that's a, that one is that makes one stronger or weaker. I'm just saying that makes that is a distinction, and if it's a distinction of um, character or quality or gender, I don't know. But that's it, there's an interesting distinction there. Um, you know what I think would be very good, and that is that we have um, an audience here made up of artists and 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 real lovers of art, and we're. Um, I, I'd like to uh, get some more perspectives, and uh, it doesn't have to be a question, just your, your own responses to what you're seeing is, is very cool as well. Yes, front um, row. Well, I'm I curious know. because of one, one thing interests me, historically speaking, which is I knew Marsha Marcus's work because, through Mimi in the like early, early 70s, and, and it really stayed with me, but then she disappears in some sense. Mm. And it's very interesting to see this work now. I think it's marvelous work, and it's so related to artists that we're thinking about now. Um, but that period was the period, period of feminist um, art history, of looking, just sort of basically looking for women artists to create a, ca a new canon. And so someone like Sylvia Slay was mm. picked up and put into that mm -hmm. canon. Mm -hmm. And now when I look at it, I think, well, why wasn't Marsha? She didn't have a Larry, her husband, Holloway. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Holloway was uh, Sylvia's well, that's husband. An odd way. That's, an, that's an odd thing that's because well, how, how did, I mean, I understand what you're saying, except that in terms of uh, the women who were trying to create mm. the, the history, yeah. Why, there's some reason that maybe has something to do with her own attitude. I don't know where she some she did not put her. I don't know what the story is, but I wonder why she was not seen 
the work she was doing because people were interested in figuration, they were interested in representation of women. Um, and you know, everybody yeah. needs somebody. And uh, Marsha, Red did try to put Marsha into Marlborough Gallery, and they they didn't like her work. Mm -hmm. Probably was too feminine. Well, no, but that's 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 yeah. Was, that's what I'm saying, though. But there were women who were looking. Just that's the moment where Alice Neal's career is yeah, refocused. She has the retrospective, and yeah. and whether whatever she thought about feminism, she people started to want her to speak and appear, and so it's almost like she didn't have to care that much about the feminist movement herself. It came to her, and it created a dialogue about her. And just yeah. at that moment, Marcia seems. Not to be not to be there anymore. There. And it's it's. I mean, I'm glad it's now the work is yeah. the same. Well, I, she, I, from a family way, she had a, that was a very difficult time, and that might have it was financially difficult for her as well as she got divorced. I see. You know, there were things long. that were setbacks, mm -hmm. and and those kind of setbacks can totally total right you that's know? that that's and i don't lot, really yeah. know i mean i mean i'm curious with you because there were years and years i didn't see marcia even though for several years around this time i i saw her ex very very frequently so there you are right i couldn't answer it's very legitimate what you're saying though thank you um i i meant to also if i could just please i meant to ask um if, if people would Tell us their name because, um, you know, it's. it's can you Mira Shaw. I'm Mira Shaw. Mira Shaw. Oh, right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm Sheila Schwitt. And um, no, you're not good on my. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Sheila. Oh, I, do, I don't keep track of dates in my life, but I do remember there was a time when she was extremely depressed because a friend of mine would tell me about what was going on with Marsha, and I really felt very bad. I, did, I wasn't close enough to her to reach out to her directly. She didn't want it. I'd had a feeling she didn't, but. Uh, in other words, you know, people aren't always up to. No, I, I what you're both, what both of you were yeah, saying, of right. course, enriches yeah. how art history gets written. That's so right. That a setback yes. that, yeah. that, right. that sets someone back is enough to, especially for a woman artist or an artist of color, it's just mm -hmm. enough to set them off into Nowheresville. And it's yeah. great. Yeah. 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 And she, well, 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 she had two children as yeah. well. Yeah. I wanted to say two more things that I think. So did other women artists. So did other women artists, yeah. yes. I want to say one thing, and but that is that people keep talking about the parties. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that people were struggling. Mm -hmm. They were working their asses and they didn't have much money. And people from the outside said, oh, the parties, we want to know about the parties. I'm not talking about you, sir. I'm talking about, you know, I've been on other talks. Yes. And I say to myself, well, probably they are interested in the parties and they probably would have liked to have come to the party, but the party was not nearly as important as the work, the work. and the mm. money and, and just everyday struggles. Yeah. And for so, Marsha to do mm. this throws me away because she went through so much to That's reach right. this. Mm. I have great respect for her, and I just want to say one more thing, and that is the drawing is, mm -hmm. the drawing is incredible. Mm -hmm. And also, I'd like to know, did you, I mean, to pose for her must have been really, really. Well, Fred Astaire helped. <laughs> <laughs> painting while well, a person's posing, that's really... I don't remember the drawing anywhere as much as the painting. The painting part was really, really interesting to me. She filled it up. But um, she, uh, she painted me twice, once with Red and Saskia, and Red has that painting. And um, I have a beautiful painting of her house on the dunes, which I gave to Saskia. And it, it, she, she's a wonderful painter. Uh, about posing, you know, I don't know if everybody here has posed for different painters, but mm. in my lifetime, I've posed for a lot of different painters, and it's always hard, it's always boring, but you always learn something. And mm. by learning something, it's really worth it. Yeah. As I, I always remember her taking that little bit of paint out of the big mm. box as an example. <laughs> and saving the color. Yes. Saving the colors. Thank you very, very much for actually reminding us that it was work more than parties, and that's a very valuable point. Thanks. Yes? I actually want to 
bring uh, Carrie James Marshall into the picture. And uh, I just want to, I want to acknowledge that there's a conversation going on here between Carrie James Marshall, Alex Katz, and Marsha, which is the question of like, what is okay at a certain era? And, and why did Alex Katz's work get, you know, shown? And why did it Marshall's? And maybe it is about gender. And I want to propose that. And I also want to put into the question of Carrie James Marshall and his work. And, and when it was shown and how it was shown in race and, and gender. And these are things that, you know, 60 years ago they weren't okay and now they are, right? Because we're showing them. And what's the equivalent of that today as a young painter? Like, what is pushing that boundary in the way that Marsha did? Because her, her work, I think, was a little bit too feminine. So, it's a lot. Feminine, but, as opposed, but not... Yeah. Well, I, th I think right. we have to be careful about scrutinizing the work. Um, I think there's a lot that goes into the success of an artist, um, and the work is one piece of it. There's a lot of work that happens outside of the studio for an artist that contributes to a career. I wasn't there, so I don't know. But uh, there, there is a political aspect that you know, an artist has to sort of advocate for their own work, build relationships. Uh, all those things go into who is remembered, who's written about, who's successful, who gets the shows, who doesn't. So um, I just I think it's important that we consider the whole thing, mm. not merely the merits of the work, because what can happen at that point is, you know, I've had a, a dealer tell me, you know, well look, maybe there weren't black people, you know, in the auctions, that kind of thing, because they, they weren't making the good work. The good work came later. The good work came in the nineties. This is seriously someone told me. <laughs> but he crafted his own narratives, right? And he, he was obviously, you know, missing some information. But we have to be careful in assessing the merits of the work and saying maybe the work was too this or too that. Um, I think the work is exquisite. Um, and I think that it, it was probably more about what happened around the activity in the studio that contributed to why she was there or not. And also, let's point out historically, um, she's in Whitney Annuals, so the catalogs of them here, and... and in those same Whitney annuals, Alex Katz was not represented, and um, uh, Alex Katz really struggled through the uh, 60s and 70s. That's not, he was not a superstar in those days. He's a, he's a bit of a Cadillac in the garage too. I mean, there was a um, Kerry James Marshall is an interest. I thought you were going to make a, an interesting formal case about Kerry James Marshall. You, you realize he's 30, 30, 40, 40 years younger than. Than these guys. I so suspect Carrie probably didn't see her work. I don't know. I I, guess I, there's no sure way. There's, there's no way. Yeah. Anyway, let's take some more voices. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Howard, Howard Sherman. Howard Sherman, please. You know, I mentioned uh, pop art earlier. But yeah, I the yeah, panel yeah. could speak a little bit more uh, as to the influence of that in the work. I mean, there's some obvious influences, but there's something about the um, the stare of some of the figures. It's almost. Um, Reappropriated in a way, if that makes sense. In this, and I don't know if, the, if that's too far a stretch to incorporate that into the way that people would think about making pop art. But you have to kind of talk about that a little bit. And what do you mean, reappropriating no. what? Well, uh, you know, the way that a lot of the famous pop artists were using reappropriating materials, you know, in a very odd way. Reappropriate or appropriate? Appropriate. Appropriate would be fine too, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, but these are, of course, portraits from life. Uh, like uh, Sherman. So Marisol did sort of things like that had this kind of eyes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you can see yeah. Marisol. Marisol's a strong, nice. yes, sure. definitely. But I think um, just to pick up on that point, I mean, the pop art thing. Uh, she, her generation is proto pop, I and mean, really, I mean, they, they, the pop artists. Um, just as the minimal artist did not invent reduction, the pop artist did not invent looking at popular culture. And, and we just need to constantly remind, I'm sorry to be the pedantic professor on the panel, but we do actually just need to remind ourselves the fact that the, the movements that, that get named something don't necessarily invent the thing that you associate with its name. And Maybe that's what he meant by reappropriation. Uh, maybe, yeah, okay. But uh, um, what's, what's legitimate though is that there's a, a pop in quotes kind of um, uh, sensibility. Um, shall we all participate together? Once? Okay. Uh, that's, there's a sensibility, uh, a way of 
there's a kind of cinematic quality, for instance. Rather than, rather than caring about whether it's pop art or not, we could think about um, the contemporaneity, the billboard-like quality, the cinematic quality, the televisual quality, whatever. Maybe, if it's there or not, or well, we see it if we don't. I think Derek articulated it interestingly in terms of the way it relates to design and advertising and marketing culture, which pop right. art all redeployed. But then, and, uh, but then I use the word metabolize, and, and that's where it went, in the sense like she's metabolizing it in, and in what in a way in which like I think Benjamin thought about like infusing these commodities with something quite sublime, mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in that way where she's that 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 I think she's dealing with. But also it's like she wants to make paintings, but she also wants to address the ideas that are on the table that are that are that are grabbing painting by the cult by the coattails and critiquing it and trying to dismantle it and kill it whatever and she's using those co those kind of co critiques to try to figure out her way to make paintings i mean that's what painters always d have done mm. um, and you know in modernism that's all you can do and i and i and i think you see it and that's why i bring up somebody like domenico gnoli in that sense this like the influence of Gnoli on, uh, from American pop art when it gets to Rome, and he's like, he's basically making sand sculptures as a, uh, as a, as an art de povera character, mm -hmm. and suddenly he's like, I'm going to paint clothing, right? I mean, fashion. He goes right into Benjamin in fashion, and this is this is in this room. It's all over this room. It's like I don't know if she was reading that or not, but in some way there was a kind of consciousness of it at that time that ricochets off of pop art and I, but I don't think she's she has the same meaning behind why she's thinking about those objects as as Warhol or Lichtenstein is doing maybe Lichtenstein a little bit that'd be a more interesting comparison but whatever but she's got a formed language as they're emerging let's not get our history right. backwards I mean she's a, she's a slightly older than these yeah she, she's yeah. ahead of them she's ahead of them yeah, yeah. Please, let's... I'm let's, not saying no, no, no. that she's before or after. Or I'm just saying that... Well, I'm saying she before. is. She's before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying she's thinking about those things, okay. but she's making a painting that is more... His, not trying to be formally innovative like a pop painting. Um, right. She was friends with de Kooning, and she also knew Larry Rivers. So well, I think Melissa Rockwood. Oh, well, don't look there. Don't. I'm just saying, you know, she also knew Larry Rivers, so if you want to go into mm. that direction instead of emphasizing <coughs> Alex Katz, I think you also have to think about Larry Rivers. Yes. In that period. But also her friendship with de Kooning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, now, I just wanted to add something to uh, what Mira Schwartz said before about other women having children. Yes. And it was just sort of dismissive. I mean, every it's all the cases are different. I mean, a large <laughs> part of what a large part of what she seems to about, be about what we've said tonight is that her view is very feminine. I mean, and then she sort of she got depressed, she got divorced, she had kids. I mean. You, when you work and you go out and you make contacts and you keep yourself in the art world, it's already it was stacked, mm. from what I understand, against women, right? And I'm just, I guess, well, my point even now, temp, you know, dismissing that, that dismissing. the women had children and having, you know, somebody was also helping other women, you know, like um, uh, Elizabeth Murray, I think she had a fabulous husband who helped with the kids. Um, you know, do, am I misunderstanding something? Yeah, yeah. 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 so, you all had two kids under tremendously difficult circumstances. Elizabeth Murray raised her son with no help whatsoever and created her career. It's, it, she had a second marriage with more success. With more, when she was more successful. Um, all I was saying, I'm not diminishing the, the role of, of the burden, whatever, of having children. I'm just saying that in the 70s, many of the women who began to have other women look at their work, who began to be written about, did have children. So having children alone would not be the reason why one would. But it was all the circumstances together, and that was. Yeah, no, I mean, hearing, hearing what her life was like at that key moment is very explanatory. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, Der uh, Dennis? Um, I just wanted to say that I don't think you can, you have to consider the background and the context when each work was made, and you can't, like, have this, you know, objective formal analysis that neglects 
what the context was and what those people were fighting against. I mean, I know that when I came to the city in like 73, you could not be a painter who was like having people pose for you. And no matter how kind of, you know, no matter how kind of uh, specific and minimalist your, you know, your, your background was, I mean, Barclay Hendricks that was at that time was had traction, but he was using photographs and he was sort of in the context of photorealism, which was like the big thing in you know in the early 70s. So it each context changes, and you know I think if you like look at Alice Neal in the context of of what was going on and what had gone on you know, right before, um, you know, she was making that work at the time, even though all the artists, you know, knew her work. Um, it wasn't fitting in with, like, the contempt, the narrative that was being created, whether it was being created by men or not, it was, you know, the men themselves had to, like, duke it out among, you know, among themselves. There was, like, there was always a contentious, though a competition, for visibility going on, and also a narrative of, against which all of this stuff happens. So, and it goes to Mira, uh, Mira's question about like, well, you know, so why was Sylvia Slay, you know, taken up? But that was like also, a, you know, aside from the um, Lawrence Holloway thing. Well, Mimi said that, but they don't want to. Mimi said you. Oh. <laughs> I mean, but it's interested to hear that. No. Um, <laughs> okay. um, Dennis, I think that's a strong and relevant point, and I thank you very much for putting it so so forcefully. Yes. Any more comments and questions? Because I think we're getting towards uh, at the back. Yes. Sorry, um, Kate. Uh, okay, you know, an obvious question. We're 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 throwing the idea of the feminine. <laughs> So I'm uh, looking around and I see really uh, similar value shifts. So sensitivity, I see um, very precise silhouettes, I see specificity in the gaze, and I see realistic nipples as opposed to like Wesselman's nipples, and an yeah. oval, which is a shape I rarely see. Um, I see, so I see a sense of awkwardness, but I'm not going to assign those to necessarily to a feminine style of painting. I'd like there to be some sort of um, from the from the panel. I, I'd love to hear how we are assigning that as an adjective. And the other thing is I love that Angie mentioned Noli because I've been looking at him lately and I think there's a very interesting contrast between these paintings and Noli because Noli sort of hides a, a, a breathing presence underneath an absence like a, a penis or like two people or like a crease mm -hmm. underneath the fabric that has pattern that moves to show this presence underneath. And I think that these paintings kind of do the opposite. I think that there's like um, the presence and the absence play the flip of that. Wouldn't you say, Angie? I mean, yeah. <laughs> An artist who was uh, incredibly popular in Italy at the time we were living there was Adami. Oh. It was maybe yeah. that well known now, but no, no, so Valerio Adami, sure. He just had a huge show in Rome. Good, mm. I'm glad he's being revived. But, but he's um, he's a kind of hard edge pop kind of. I'm saying that mm. he was as popular as anyone. Popular, yes, but also pop. I mean, yes, Derrida's famous favorite artist. Well, I'm just oh, you mean in every sense. Uh, the point <laughs> is that he was very popular at the and Martin yes. saw his work. It's <laughs> uh, bringing that out as. Uh, you know, uh, so maybe not Noli, but a uh, 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 yeah. weak influence, you know, not necessarily literal. Right, right. I think um, I think we're about. Could we go back to the 
Yes. Uh, actually, if you don't mind, Kate, we're towards the end of the evening now, and I don't think it's time to put new questions to the panel. Is anyone burning, uh, bursting to ask one? No, somebody hasn't spoken yet who'd like to. My entire reputation as moderator is going out the window. Yeah, another person who knew Marsha has got something to say. Martha, yes. What, what would you like to... Martha Edelheim. Yeah. No, first of all, I remember when Martha had her parties, they were not party parties. They were parties because she was trying to sell her work. Exactly. They uh -huh. weren't about exactly. just having a party. Oh, she right. invited people over. She had all of her portfolios out so that people mm -hmm. would hopefully buy something. That's so how she, she could got pay Walter rent. to pay for oh, his wow. rent parties. Mm -hmm. they that's how she parties. got Walter to pay for her trips. And that, yeah, exactly. Oh, ah, that's, a, that's the perspective Marcia, we need. Thank one you. One of the things that's yeah. missing in all of this is that Marsha had a wicked sense of humor. Uh -huh. mm. yep, she she was say really so. funny and she yeah. could be really sharp and mm. sharp toothed. <laughs> Mm. And her work is extremely cool. Mm. It's extremely frontal and extremely delicate at the same time. It was totally out of what anybody else was doing at yeah. that time. And it had nothing to do with cats. Right. <laughs> nothing. I, I mean, I can't even, even Zero. if they were classmates, Zero. I can't even put them in the same room Zero. together right. in terms of visual anything. They simply don't work together. Uh -huh. uh, her, and one of the problems I think she had, even though she had some success, was that it was work that was so different. Mm -hmm. It didn't fit in to pop. It did not fit into any category at that time. And it's part of what many women as artists have been doing. They yes. have simply not fit into the box that the current mode was. They were not pop. They were not minimalist. They were not part of that scenario. And it, was, it made it extremely hard as a woman to be, have any kind of success. And that, that answers the question, Kate, that you're asking. Right. What she's saying answers what you're saying. And that's right. what I was trying to say about them, is that they don't fit in. They metabolize it all. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it doesn't redistribute those aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Because there's something very subjective about what she's doing that is singular to her. And it was singular and unique, and it was also very much, I mean, you know, the fact that she was in Italy and she was looking at Grisé, mm -hmm. she was looking yeah. at frescoes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's where this is coming from. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's, it's not coming from pop artists, it's coming out of that kind of a context. Absolutely. That's but why we mentioned that. But Piero in particular, Manzini yes. in particular. They fit in this context now. Oh, she did. Now is where, now this, now we have a context in which all of these things are familiar and they make sense. And even though, like we're talking about like Barclay Hendrix or, um, I'm sorry, the, the woman that's painting the Obama portrait, but those things actually create the context to see these things. So I think there's, you know, a lot of times that artists don't fit in their context, but that doesn't right. mean that, you know, if the, if, that doesn't mean they won't fit into a context some other time. And also another point to talk about context is that um, we think we know the past because we have our 101 art history courses that tell us there was pop art, there was minimal art, blah, blah, blah. But you look through the pages of a Whitney annual or you look through the ads of art news at the time and you see that art history, art when it's not history, when it's the contemporary moment, is just as confused as our present feels at any time in the past and that it, you've got your pop artists, you've got your minimal artists, okay, the canonical ones. You've got hundreds and hundreds of very interesting artists, some of whom are having better careers than those canonical pop and minimal artists who are doing things that don't quite fit. I mean, somebody like uh, Howard Kanovitz, for instance. Uh, you look at his work, you'd say, oh, that, you could say that of, or, or even of Larry Rivers. There's of, of, of many, many artists who were well considered in that moment, who don't fit neatly into the boxes anymore, and we can, we can now romanticize them not fitting into the boxes and saying, oh, it's a unique feminine sensibility, and oh, it's because she's in Italy. No, it's because uh, that's not the way art history works. Right. Sorry, that's my two cents worth. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.